This is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nation Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering six conversations from our two-day coverage of the Liver Meeting 2022 and, instead of the vault, an interview with Inventiva Pharmaceuticals Chief Medical Officer Michael Corman and Stephen Harris. On October 31st, Inventiva Pharma Chief Medical Officer Michael Corman joined Stephen Harrison and me to talk a bit about the company and to provide detail and color on key elements of the Inventiva Clinical Development Strategy for his pan PPAR line of Fibrador. Discussion focused on the Phase 2B native trial, the Phase 3 Native 3 trial, and combination trial legend with the SGLT2 inhibitor and Paclofloxin that had just begun to recruit. Rather than summarize the interview, I suggest you simply listen to it. Lani is an exciting developmental drug that has performed well in trials so far. Inventiva has incorporated some innovative elements into his trial design. Michael explains things very well, and as you know, Stephen asks great questions. So just sit back, listen, enjoy, and learn. So today we have a special interview with Dr. Michael Corman from Inventiva Pharma. Michael, good afternoon. Michael Corman. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. And Stephen has been good enough to join us for this. Stephen, good afternoon. How are you today? Stephen Harrison. Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure. We're heading into AASLD week this week, so I think everybody's schedules are a little bit crazed, and everybody is tremendously excited about the meeting. And Michael's going to talk a little bit about Inventiva Pharma and Lanafibrinor for those in our audience who do not know the company. I'm sure everybody knows the drug. But Michael, before we get started, just take a minute or two and introduce yourself to our listeners. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your history. And when you're done, one fact about you that we might not know if you didn't tell us on this podcast, and it can't be the one I'm going to tell immediately, which is that Michael now lives one town away from where my wife grew up. So we're familiar with a lot of the same geography. Michael, you're up. Thank you. So about myself, I'm a gastroenterologist, hepatologist, and I've been working roughly half of my career in academia in Amsterdam and the other half in pharmaceutical and biotech industry in research and development, mostly in the field of uh, immunology, autoimmunity, and corresponding diseases. I live in New Jersey, as you know, and something about myself that you don't know, I like to ski and to hike, so I'm uh, very much an outdoor person, but I also like the fact that I live near to New York City, uh, giving me all the cultural opportunities. That's excellent, and, and a wonderful introduction. Michael, I'm confident our audience knows a bunch about Lanafibrinor as an exciting drug and fatty liver development pipeline. We've talked about it several times on the podcast. In fact, it probably comes up in some form or another once every two or three weeks. But I'm not sure everybody knows very much about Inventiva Pharma as a company. So to get started, can you just take a few minutes to tell our listeners about the company and your background, how you came to join it and your role in it today? Sure. Inventiva is a small company, but growing. The company has been around for 10 years. We actually had our 10-year celebration a couple of weeks ago. It's a spin-off of Abbott. Originally, it was the research site of a French company called Fournier, which we together with Abbott. The company is based in Dijon, France and in the US. Our teams are really spread across France and in the US. And the company focuses on the discovery and the development of oral small molecules for novel treatments of diseases with an uh, unmet medical need, including NASH. So we have expertise in nuclear receptors, transcription factors and epigenetic modulators. We have a total of about 110 employees and the majority of them, about 80 people are in our scientific team. So that's uh, the company in itself. We have an, a pipeline of compounds. We have Odipercil, which is in phase two clinical development. It's, it's a compound for a rare genetic disease, a lysosomal storage disorder, mucopolysaccharidosis 6. And based on very positive interactions with the FDA, we are looking for a partner to uh, co-develop this compound. We have an, an active discovery program in Dijon in uh, oncology and the most advanced compound in preclinical work is focused on Yaptit as a target in oncology. And then, of course, our lead compound is Lanofibrinor, which is in phase three, which is a pan piper agonist and has received breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA. We have a current partnership with Sinobiopharm, an affiliate of Sinobiopharm CTTQ, which has recently acquired the rights to develop and potentially commercialize Lanofibrinor in China. So, so much about an introduction to the company. Okay, that's great. One other thing we like to ask people when they come on is what you see happening for the company, or where, where the company aspires to be, say, five years from now, to the degree that you can answer that question. Well, in five years, we see ourselves closer to our goal, which is to make lanofibrinor available to patients as an effective oral therapy for patients with NASH in the U.S. and elsewhere. So our focus is really on our current phase three study to realize that. And we're very positive about that. That will also give the company overall a broader foot 
research, which will enable us to continue to drive our, our innovation in, in other areas as well. So we're going to come back and talk about the phase three study. I think what we'd like to do with most of the rest of this conversation is walk through Lanafibrinor and some of the clinical development highlights and issues as we've gone along. Why don't we start with your phase two work, the studies, the New England Journal article, native study design, and anything you think folks should know about that, and other key papers or presentations over the past year that have taken advantage of that data. And then after that, we'll have some questions from Stephen and maybe from me, and then we'll go on. Yeah, sure. So the phase two study is called the native study. That was our phase two B study in uh, patients with NASH. Patients had a uh, degree of activity defined as inflammation and ballooning degeneration. And with regard to fibrosis, patients with cirrhosis were excluded. It was a treatment duration of 24 weeks, so about half a year. And we tested two doses of lanofibrinor compared to uh, placebo. And it was a liver biopsy taken at baseline and at end of treatment to evaluate the efficacy based on the surrogate histological endpoint. And in addition to that, uh, and, uh, a considerable number of uh, serum and imaging markers of liver injury and of cardiometabolic health as well. Uh, the study was mainly run in the European Union, in Europe, and in the United States, and uh, there were more than 200 patients enrolled. So that's the, the study design. The data, uh, to come to your question about uh, the New England Journal of Medicine paper, were published last year. We were very pleased with the acceptance, of course, and New England Journal of Medicine. The data of natives showed essentially that lanofibrinor has beneficial effects on a broad disease biology of NASH, both the liver manifestations of uh, meta- and also on the metabolic immune markers that at the same time are also risk factors for cardiometabolic health. Now, the New England Journal of Medicine paper covers mainly the liver histology and the liver tests and also the favorable uh, safety profile. The patients that were enrolled in Native, I think they were typical for patients with NASH. They had a typical metabolic profile. 40% of them had type 2 diabetes. And the highlights of the data, lanofibrinor showed a significant improvement in histological endpoints. And I'd like to point out that the endpoint NASH resolution, which is improved of fibrosis and ballooning degeneration and improvement of fibrosis compared to placebo was clearly met. Lanofibrinol showed showed clearly superiority compared to placebo on that endpoint, which is a high bar, certainly after six months of treatment, and also, I think, very meaningful for the clinical perspectives of uh, lanofibrinol treatment. And in addition to the histology, we had a number, as I mentioned, of non-invasive serum-based biomarkers, which also show that there is an improvement of markers of liver injury, of inflammation, and fibrosis. And based on these data, the FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation. So that's a summary of what the New England Journal of Medicine uh, paper contains. And as you mentioned, we have uh, in the past year and a half presented additional data, which are essentially analysis of the native data. So while the New England Journal of Medicine paper focuses mainly on the improvement of the liver values, these analyses include, for one, just as, an, as a couple of examples, in application of quite stringent statistical methods to identify non-invasive biomarkers that predict histological response. And that has that work has been done in collaboration with Dr. Boussier at the University of Angers and was presented at EASL earlier this year. So that's one path, I would say, of additional analysis. And the other main path is a uh, number of analysis on the variety of markers of cardiometabolic health. NASH, as we all know, is a uh, metabolic immune liver disease and a pan PIPAR agonist as lanofibrinor acts on the three isoforms of PPAR transcription factors, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. Now, these have distinct overlapping roles in the regulation of metabolism, lipid metabolism, insulin resistance, inflammation in the liver and in adipose tissue and in many other organs and tissues that are involved in metabolism, homeostasis. So you expect that lanofibrinor has a beneficial effect on these markers as well. They are upst- upstream in the NASH disease biology and at the same time, time they represent risk factors for cardiometabolic health. And in the analysis, we have covered the effect of lanofibrinor compared to placebo on lipid metabolism, on control of glycemia, insulin resistance, systemic inflammation, diastolic blood pressure, and also hepatic steatosis measured by ultrasound-based imaging, a fibrous cap. And those data confirm indeed that lanofibrinor has that broad effect on the NASH disease biology. Now, some noteworthy information, you know, about one third of the patient or additional information about one third of the patients who have lanofibrinor have an increase of weight if you define it as 5% increase over baseline or more and 
and we've shown that these patients have actually the same degree of improvement of their cardiometabolic health. So their insulin sensitivity improves, their hepatic fat decreases and so on, which has been described also for other PPAR agonists that the weight change is completely independent of the change or the metabolic improvement is completely independent of the change in weight. So that's, I think, a noteworthy aspect. And another one which I think is worth mentioning is that I mentioned that 40% of patients have type 2 diabetes, but among those who do not have type 2, over type 2 diabetes, a substantial proportion have prediabetes defined by a high fasting glucose level. And those patients, also the majority of them, after lanofibrinol treatment, have normal fasting glucose levels. So they, the prediabetic status is returned to normal in those patients. So that has been our focus of our presentations in the past year. There's a lot of positive momentum with lanofibrinor in this field and the treatment of NASH and where this mechanism actually is headed. A lot of positive traction. And so maybe before we talk about the phase three trial, drilling down on the phase two, just to provide a little more color for the audience, I wanted to ask a little bit about two things. One, the methodology that you used in interpreting the histopathology, because it is in some ways a bit different than others and in some ways similar, but I think it's worthy of a discussion just briefly. And then the second point is drilling down a bit more on some of the extra hepatic benefits of the drug. You know, one of the things I like about lanofibrinor is that it does target multiple different pathways. And in doing that, it has the benefit of actually helping not only the liver disease as measured histopathologically, but some of the metabolic components as well. And I think it's maybe worthy of a bit more discussion there. So first question, Michael, would be diving into the biopsy methodology a bit more. It's a bit all over the map how companies read out histology. And so maybe if you could take a moment just to talk through how you read out the phase 2B, you know, looking at the SAF versus the NASH CRN and how your liver biopsies were read. You know, was it one pathologist, two? Was it consensus read? You know, just a little bit of color there if, if you don't mind. You're right that we use two different scores in native. We use the SAF score and the NASH CRN score. The rationale for choosing the SAF score was essentially to make sure that patients who are enrolled in the native study have a certain degree of inflammation and a certain degree of tissue injury measured with ballooning degeneration so that you, know, you target the patient population that is assumed to need it most. The primary efficacy endpoint in the native study was also based on, on the SAF score. Now, if you look at so the, the NASH CRN score was uh, used as a second the efficacy endpoint. But it's, I think, important to mention that the efficacy, so defined as the difference between the two doses and placebo, were actually quite comparable whether or not you apply the uh, SAF score or the NASH CRN score. And also, if you uh, define NASH improvement, including steatosis, which you don't do in the primary efficacy endpoint, but when you do that, you actually come to the same efficacy results because lanofibrinor also leads to an a reduction of hepatic fat as we have shown previously. With regard to uh, or in the native study, the biopsy samples at the end of the study were read serially by one pathologist, uh, Pierre Bedoza, who had, at the time of, of the reading was not aware when the samples were obtained, so baseline or end uh, of the assigned regimen. And we of course realized that the variability between observers and also within one observer is uh, has been a big challenge with regard to the scoring of uh, liver biopsies and in order to uh, adjust that or, or control that as good as is possible I believe for native tree we have a uh, team of three expert pathologists who will read each biopsy in a way that uh, and eligibility and also at the end of the treatment the scoring is based on a consensus between two of the three pathologists and if there is no consensus on one of the uh, critical evaluations for eligibility, then there is a third pathologist who is a tiebreaker. So that's how we address as much as we can the uh, variability that is inherent, I think, to the scoring system that we apply in using histology readouts. I totally agree. I mean, I think we struggle with the variability, the sampling variability, the, the heterogeneity of the biopsy tissue, and then of course the intern and intra-observer variability. So I think the field has certainly moved towards 
trying to achieve some sort of consensus. And whether it's two pathologists or three, I think gaining consensus of at least two of the three is kind of where the field has migrated to. It would be interesting to see how AI digital pathology figures out how to integrate into that And do they integrate into that in some sort of hybrid assessment at the end of the day? And I think we'd we'd need a little bit more data, but there is some signal that potentially including AI digital pathology may stabilize placebo response rates a bit. I think that data has been presented numerous times, not published fully yet in manuscript form, but something to keep an eye on. Michael, just drilling down a little bit more on the extra hepatic benefits and reflecting back on the New England Journal paper, there were some broad comments made relative to the improvement in glycemic control, which you would expect with this type of mechanism, and also on some of the lipid parameters, particularly improvement in HDL cholesterol and a lowering in triglyceride levels. Any additional follow-up comments from you in there or additional analyses that were done in that regard? Yeah, of course, we we had to do the analysis based on the samples that were available and the analysis done at the time that Native was conducted. So with regard to lipid profiles, we have shown that total triglycerides go down significantly with lanofibrinor, that HDL cholesterol goes up with lanofibrinor compared to placebo. And we have also looked at at the apolipoproteins A1, B, and C3 and the ratio of A1 and B. And that also improves in the right direction, clearly with lanofibrinor. And these changes are seen equally in patients who have diabetes and who don't have diabetes. As I mentioned before, they're also seen equally in patients who have a stable weight, which is about half of the patients, and the one-third who have an increase in weight of more than 5% or 5% or more. So we have a clear effect on insulin resistance. I think that's a relevant finding. And also on systemic inflammation, which has CRP, which is also a well-known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So everything that was looked at really improves in the right direction. If you look at... Uh... I was really impressed with the, with the highly sensitive CRP reduction. And that often doesn't get talked about as much in the hepatology field, maybe as much as it does in the cardiometabolic field. So I think it is important to highlight what you've shown with Lanny in the phase two and looking forward to see, you know, how that translates into phase three as well. Yes, that's an interesting, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Stephen, because indeed I have had the opportunity to discuss our data with cardiologists and they usually uh, are very uh, impressed by the effect on HSCRP. Why don't we move on in our discussion? And if you could take a few minutes and tell us, first of all, what will you be sharing this week at the liver meeting? Thank you. So the presentation at ASLD later this week is all about adiponectin and adiponectin levels in the native study. So adiponectin is an adipokine that is related to uh, insulin sensitivity, metabolic health of adipose tissue, maturation of post tissue. So it's quite an important messaging molecule in metabolism. And it's downstream of PPAR signal. It's been shown that patients with NASH and also with cardiovascular disease have low levels of adiponectin on average, and, and we see that indeed in the patients uh, who were enrolled in native. And in both lanofibrinor arms, adiponectin increases, and that increase correlates nicely with the improvement of the several markers of cardiometabolic health that we've just discussed. So you do not see that in placebo. There's no increase in, in adiponectin, and uh, the markers of cardiometabolic health also don't improve or get worse even. So it's, it basically links the improvement of cardiometabolic health at least to an, uh, an important part to adiponectin and the mechanism of action of lanofibrinor, and that will be presented on Saturday or this Saturday. Okay, thank you. So Michael, can you tell us a little bit about your phase three trial for Lanny? Yeah, sure. So phase three study is a native three study. It's our pivotal study to confirm the therapeutic benefit of lanofibrinor in, uh, in patients with NASH and fibrosis, not The goal is, of course, to obtain approval for these patients. The inclusion criteria are kept as close as possible to uh, those uh, of native because the treatment duration is longer. But we have similar criteria for the activity of the disease, so natural inflammation and ballooning degeneration. And and with regard to fibrosis, patients need to have stages F2 and F3. So that's the patient population that by and large needs uh, treatment most. The study has uh, two parts. Uh, The first part is enrolling up to 900 patients. 
patients and there will be a biopsy after 72 weeks of treatment and that biopsy compared to baseline will then uh, be used to evaluate uh, confirm the primary efficacy endpoints for this analysis which is again the NASH resolution and improvement of fibrosis and we have chosen this high bar endpoint based on our native results and confident that Danafibrinor has this effect on NASH. Uh, we have a number of secondary efficacy endpoints both histological but also a lot of non-invasive endpoints so that we get a holistic view of what lanofibrinor does in patients with NASH and we aim to submit the data for accelerated approval based on histology according to art H with the FDA and then treatment will continue for a longer period it's five to seven years depending on when the patient enters the study and we will an additional we will enroll additional patients to have a larger database and that uh, part two is meant to show outcome benefit outcome benefit is mostly progression to cirrhosis or complications of cirrhosis or cause mortality and the data from that part for uh, the outcome benefit will lead to a full approval of lanofibrinor so that's the pl overall plan we have kept two doses in the phase three study and the reasons for that are that if you look at the fibrosis scoring the higher dose 1200 milligram does better than 800 milligram although both are better than placebo if you look at the uh, metabolic markers uh, the markers of cardiometabolic health both doses are actually having the same effect on all these markers so we reason that it's quite possible that if you, if you treat longer like a year and a half in this case that both doses will be equally efficacious on the histological readout that remains to be seen but that's the the reason why we have kept the two doses i think it's important a couple really key points to highlight from your comments number one the robust endpoint of both NASH resolution and fibrosis improvement, which is a very stringent endpoint and one that, that if it's hit, that's what the EMA is looking for, for sure. And the FDA would be fine with that. So kudos to you for picking a stringent endpoint and having the confidence based on the phase two to design it that way. And then also that you're carrying forward both doses, the 800 and 1200 milligram. And just also for the listeners, again, could you uh, comment on the duration of the phase three trial for the surrogate endpoint of histology that you mentioned. For one, I, I just want to make sure that's clear. And also, number two, as you reflect on some of where the field is headed now, I'd like to get your thoughts relative to where you're headed with cirrhosis. And do you see that lanofibrinor could have a benefit in preventing progression of disease in a cirrhotic population? And if so, are there any plans to potentially study that population? And if you chose to do that, would you consider something like what Madrigal is doing, where they're doing a phase three and well-compensated cirrhotics that would provide a potential benefit back to your registration trial? Yeah, thank you. Those are very good questions indeed. Uh, I think with regard to the duration of part one in the current phase three study, I think that was your first question. The duration is every two weeks and the native has a treatment duration of six months and has already shown quite an, an improvement, you know, a meaningful improvement of fibrosis if you score it according to the staging. So uh, you could uh, argue that a year may be enough. On the other hand, a year and a half also gives us a more robust safety database. What happens if you treat longer? And that's an important aspect with regard to how the FDA sees the data that they would like to see. And that's an important component of the reasons why we took 72 weeks of treatment. Um, the other question was with regard to cirrhosis. So yes, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion also going back to the communications from the FDA about an alternative pathway to obtain approval for NASH by doing an, uh, adding an, uh, a study in patients with compensated cirrhosis using outcome benefit here defined as reduction of uh, the occurrence of decompensation of cirrhosis as an, uh, a perspective of the treatment benefit. And uh, I think uh, lanofibrinor certainly has the same potential in this patient population when you talk about patients with compensated cirrhosis. A, because it being a pan pipa agonist, it does have an effect on metabolism, it does have an effect on inflammation as well as on fibrosis and also actually on the endothelial cell functioning, something that we didn't speak about. But we have, there are also data on the protective role, to summarize it that way, of pipa signaling on the functioning of endothelial cells, which will also be important in the progression of cirrhosis. So if you take that together, 
further, I think that uh, the progression of fibrosis and, and cirrhosis is driven by metabolism, by inflammation, uh, as well as the fibrosis progress that lanofibrinol, uh, based on its mechanism of action, has all the potential to actually be efficacious in patients with compensated cirrhosis as well. And we certainly think a lot about that and, and we do consider those plans. That's right. So, Michael, we've had some discussion already on the podcast on Legend, your, your combination trial, and would love your feedback on that trial and its design and what it tells us about your view of the future of Lani in combination therapy. Yeah, thank you. So Legend is a proof of concept study and we want to evaluate the uh, effect of the combination of lanofibrinor with empagliflozin in patients with Nash and Tattoo diabetes and using a uh, biologically meaningful endpoint, which is uh, the idea of a proof of concept study. It's a uh, treatment duration of six months. Uh, HbA1c is the primary efficacy endpoint, which is of course an uh, endpoint in type 2 diabetes studies, but also is pathogenetically upstream in the disease biology of NASH, which does tell us about what you would expect uh, for patients with NFLD NASH as well. And then there are a num- large number of secondary efficacy endpoints, which uh, will provide valuable information about improvement of metabolism, the distribution of adipose tissue, for example, which is important by using blood markers, but also ultrasound and MRI-based imaging. So what does it, what does, what does our thinking about combination treatment? I think that lanofibrinol in itself addresses the broad biology of NASH. Many patients with NASH will be fine, I think, with lanofibrinol treatment, but there are, there may be, and there will be patients who will benefit from an additional medicine, from a combination treatment. So I would compare that very much with the situation of how we treat type 2 diabetes. It's the response of individual patients that will inform doctors who will benefit from a combination treatment or and when a treatment can be added. So the combination of lanofibrinor with uh, empagliflozin is expected to have an additional benefit on metabolic improvement upstream in the disease biology, which will reflect downstream of the disease at later points in time. And there's quite some data from several uh, SGL2 inhibitors and pioglitazone that that's indeed the case. So you have a further improvement compared to pioglitazone alone on HPA1C and so on. And in addition, for some patients, the weight increase may be a concern. So uh, we know that if you combine an uh, SGL2 inhibitor with lanofibrinor, balances out the weight changes. So that's an additional aspect that is, I think, relevant to look at. I think this is terrific. You had mentioned briefly this trial is six months in duration. It's focused on HbA1c, but you're also doing some non-invasive assessment of liver health, right? So can you comment on what those non-invasive tests are? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's the uh, usual, what we discussed earlier, the markers of cardiometabolic health, liver injury, and uh, inflammation. We do not use biopsy for follow-up in these patients, but we do apply ultrasound-based imaging, so fibroscan cap, you know, and also multi-scan MRI. So we'll, we'll look at multi-parametric MRI to uh, evaluate not just the liver, but also the uh, hepatic fat, the, the, the adipose tissue distribution in the body as well. So those are the non-invasive tests. I think those are terrific. I particularly like the idea of multi-parametric MRI here, looking at corrected T1 to see not only liver fat content reduction, but also an effect on disease activity. You know, what's happening to inflammation in, in these patients. That's exciting. So, so, Michael, I certainly agree with Stephen. I think that the design of the trial is exciting in that it promises a broader view of disease than simply sticking within the conventional NASH window. I think this has been incredibly helpful, Michael. I think just being able to unpack this compound, to be able to dive into your brain a bit and talk about your plans for lanofibrinor and how it fits into the armamentarium of what we have to offer our NASH patients has been incredibly insightful and helpful and uh, look forward to seeing you here in a couple days. Michael, I I completely agree with everything Stephen said. We probably get as many questions about Lani that I cannot answer as any other compound that uh, people from outside the podcast ask about. This has been an amazingly helpful opportunity to clear some of that up. Uh, Stephen, thanks for making the time today. I know this is a crazy week for you. Michael, thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing both of you gents later in the week. Sounds good. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Stephen. See you in uh, Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. And now, back to Roger. 
We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next Wednesday evening with a wrap-up episode, taking a look at some of the highlights of the meeting from the perspective of folks we may not have heard from yet, including Will Alazawi, who's been with us once, and Ron Costera, who's never been with us before. It's going to be a fantastic session. Until then, stay safe, surf hot. Look forward to seeing you again next week on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.